It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Stephanie Bonnick is the Museum Education and Tour Manager of the Oberlin Heritage Center. And in the seven months that she has been part of our team, she has absorbed an incredible amount of information, uh, met so many of you out in the public at various organizations, and has literally shared history with over a thousand adult and youth. Uh, so been very busy in her first months here. Uh, she will be telling you a little bit more about herself in just a moment here, but I wanted to add that one of the joys of working at the Oberlin Heritage Center and in this field in general is that uh, you get to meet people who have their own passions and historical interests, and it's fun to tap into those to expand your horizons and better understand the many national events that shape our collective history. So when I found out about her past research, I was very excited to invite her to present with us tonight. So with that, I will turn things over to Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna share my screen real quick. All right, and if anybody could just tell me if they can't see that, that would be fabulous. I'll just say I can see it. Great. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining me this evening. Uh, as Liz mentioned, my name is Stephanie Bonnack. I'm the Museum Education and Tour Manager at the Oberlin Heritage Center. My preferred pronouns are she and her. Um, and as uh, Liz mentioned, I'm gonna introduce myself a bit. I recently achieved my master's in history and public history from Bowling Green State University. Um, I also have my bachelor's in history with minors in anthropology and classics, as well as an associate of science and culinary arts for fun, because uh, I like learning. <laughs> Um, so in spite of beginning this research, which I'll tell you more about this evening, in the midst of COVID-19 in 2020, I was able to conduct this research thanks in part to the Cleveland Public Library, Dr. Sean Martin of Western Reserve Historical Society, and with incredible thanks to both William S. Barrow and Elizabeth Pikowski from Cleveland State University in the Michael Schwartz Library and Special Collections. As I continue to build my research, more came to light about the circumstances of unions in Cleveland, Ohio, specifically the International Ladies Garment Workers Union um, and the corresponding strikes that shaped Cleveland, Ohio, and especially communities involving immigrant women. Uh, therefore, Oberlin Heritage Center graciously allowed me to share that history and my research with you this evening for Women's History Month. Um, and although there might not be a very visible tie to Oberlin, um, being in Northeast Ohio, Many of the sentiments felt in the Cleveland garment industry were felt in other industries throughout the first half of the 20th century as well. Um, as Liz also mentioned, um, although I'm gonna get into the program itself, I just wanna express my sincerest gratitude to the Oberlin Heritage Center for allowing me to share my research for about an hour about something that not everybody finds interesting, but I do. Um, and for those of you who haven't had the chance to visit the center, I highly recommend it. It's open to the public for tours Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. It offers educational and outreach programs such as this one, as well as hosts large groups for history walks, tours, and is responsible for the preservation of all of our buildings on site, including its objects and archives. Alongside all of that, it also hosts an extensive oral history, which is consistently being added to. I do want to express that when you talk about labor unions and strikes, especially during the first half of the 20th century, there might be some quotes that are slightly upsetting, um, and I apologize for that. Um, but because I find quotes to be particularly impactful, I'm going to open with one today to get us started. The sweatshop is a state of mind as well as a physical fact. Its workday is of no fixed length. It links pace of work to endurance. It demeans the spirit by denying to workers any part in determining the conditions of or the pay for their work. As with many reforms in the United States during what we say is the progressive era in the first half of the 20th century especially, disaster was often the catalyst for change. Typically when I tell somebody that I've been researching garment labor um, and unions in Cleveland, Ohio, they almost always act, ask if it ties in to what then became known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, and the simple answer is yes. <laughs> the more complex answer is that I feel I can't talk about this specific union in the early 1900s without adding the context of the impact that the factory fire had on the formation of unions and its strength growing in the United States. Um, the fire happened on March 25th, 1911, in which 146 workers were killed. 
The company, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company, hired 600 people in total, and 500 of those employees were women. The majority of the victims in the fire were immigrant women as well. So as you can imagine then, reading firsthand accounts, newspaper articles, or even organizational documents regarding this tragedy are difficult, but I find that if we ignore it or choose not to add that context to it, it simply looks like any other workplace tragedy, yet its lasting repercussions are immense. With this in mind, this historic event highlights everyday workplace safety laws and standardized aspects of the modern workplace that we might take as everyday um, rights, but to be expected. But in the, fa in the 1890s through the 1930s, these were luxuries for employees. Organizations that we have today, like the Organi Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, um, as well as standard and set workday hours, even retirement planning and funds for some companies, religious and legal holidays, and protections for those reporting sexual harassment are all luxuries today, especially that, women's, that women have today that many working in the garment industry did not have in the early 1900s. More than that, without the creation of some labor unions, such as the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, or the ILGWU. These may be luxuries that some of us still don't have in the modern workplace. Even as current debates about minimum wage standards reflect the progressive era, um, because wages then were significantly inconsistent in industries such as garment factories of Cleveland, Ohio. That said, although there were unionization efforts in Cleveland's garment industries as early as 1903, the movements were often squashed or disorganized, and those that were squashed were by manufacturers and work contractors themselves. Therefore, on March 25th, 1911, hundreds of garment workers went to work at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company, located on the top three floors of the Ash Building in New York City. Because it was a Saturday, other clothier businesses had already left by 1 p.m., leaving workers on only the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors. What many state was either a cigarette butt or a match not fully put out would change everything. At roughly 4.40 p.m., Nearly five hours after other employees in the rest of the building had gone home, a fire broke out on the eighth floor, spreading rapidly and causing mass panic among its employees. For those on the eighth floor, the service elevator was readily available to help them. And that service elevator made dozens of trips doing just that. Those on the 10th floor were often able to climb out onto the roof and cross to another building owned by NYU where students were helping them cross to safety. But unfortunately for those on the ninth floor, They'd been locked in by the owners throughout the week to ensure no more workers were pilfering supplies from the factory floor. So for those locked in on the ninth floor, they only had three means of escaping. Down the fire escape that could only hold one person, a fire escape whose securing facets had become increasingly loose and rusted, the staircase, which was noted for being fireproof, but completely on the other side of the room with a door that only opened inwards and was locked. And finally, the ninth floor window. On all three floors, many chose the final option as panicked workers stampeded one another to get to exits and doors and fire escapes. Because the garment factory was notoriously messy and known for oily rags and paper patterns to be strewn about, strewn about, the fire rapidly then engulfed all three floors. And on that fatal day, most of the victims were suffocated or burned to death within the building, but some who fought their way to the windows and leapt met death as surely, but perhaps more quickly on the pavements below. Therefore, what would, would then become known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in March of 1911 became a catalyst for many garment workers already dissatisfied and maybe those who were not yet part of a union uh, to strike, not just in New York, but nationwide, thus strengthening the presence of unions in metropolitan centers like Cleveland, Ohio. Which then brings me to Cleveland, Ohio itself. Uh, to introduce Cleveland and to show what makes it so unique in the story, I have some dates that'll help give you a picture of its massive growth from very humble beginnings. And I have also included some international affairs happening at certain years to highlight just when immigrants, especially Jewish women immigrants began arriving in Cleveland, Ohio. And in 1796, the land was first surveyed by Moses Cleveland. And within four years, the population totaled seven people. By the year 1820, the population had significantly risen to 606 people. And in, internationally, the first documented anti-Jewish pogrom occurred in Odessa, Ukraine in 1821, but was noted as a riot rather than aimed violence. In 1836, Cleveland and what is now today Ohio City were both incorporated as official cities. 
And within four years, the population spiked again to over 6,000. In 1850, prior to the Civil War, the population in Cleveland, Ohio reached 17,034 people. And following the Civil War and the assassination of Lincoln, his body lie in state at Public Square in 1865. Within five years, the population grew substantially, rising to 92,829. Coincidentally, it was the same year that Standard Oil Company was created by John D. Rockefeller and industry was continuing to boom in the city. By 1877, there was a general railroad strike that took place and Group A, 1st Cleveland Cavalry, formed to protect the city against strikers, inciting violence, chaos, and riots. That same year, the Cleveland branch of the Socialist Labor Party organized in tandem. By the year 1880, the population had reached 160,146 people, making it the 12th largest nation, city in the nation. And that the following year, the first official state-sponsored anti-Jewish program took place in Russia following the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term pogrom, it is officially a Russian word meaning to wreak havoc or to demolish violently. Historically then, the term refers to violent attacks by local non-Jewish populations on Jews in what was the Russian empire and then later countries as well. By the year 1889, the Jewish community in Cleveland was so established that the first edition of the Hebrew Observer, a newspaper specifically within the Jewish community was published. The following year, the population rose again to 261,353 people. And by 1900, it had almost doubled by 381,768. Now, between 1903 and 1906, the second state-sponsored anti-Jewish program took place in Russia during the years of the Russo-Japanese War and the Revolution of 1905. And in this three-year period, there were over 650 pogroms prejudiced against Jewish people living within Eastern Europe. Bringing us to where the history of my research starts, the population brought, rose again in 1910 to total 560,663 people, making it officially the sixth largest city in the United States. And because I just threw a lot of numbers at you, I've also created this graph so that you can see the steady rise in population for the red box, which is Cleveland, compared to New York, Chicago, and Cincinnati. Unlike uh, Cincinnati, which eventually stagnated, Cleveland, like Chicago, was steadily rising, um, which is interesting given that the garment industry was particularly important in Cleveland in spite of it not still having the same population numbers as Chicago or New York City. As I mentioned, this brings me to 1911, and a lot of people, especially in my graduate defense, asked, so why is Cleveland so important in this? What makes Eastern European immigrants come to Cleveland, especially those of Eastern European and Jewish descent? Now, according to the Jewish Community of Cleveland by Rabbi Moses J. Price, published in 1910, the first Jewish settler, Simpson Thorman, arrived from Bavaria to Cleveland as early as 1837. And within the next two years, several others from his native town followed his arrival. Because of the conditions for Jewish people in Eastern Europe, settlement steadily continued and rose after Cleveland was officially chartered as a city. He also details in his book that by 1839, the first permanent religious organization was established under the name the Israelitic Society. A year later, a Jewish burial ground was established in what is today Ohio City on the west side of the growing metropolis. Alongside the religious organizations that began establishing throughout Cleveland, aid societies for incoming immigrants were readily established throughout the last few years of the 19th century, making Cleveland a natural destination for those arriving to what eventually was called the Golden Land of Opportunity. By the year 1850, the Tifereth Israel Congregation was organized, holding services in various private homes until it gained a permanent site to build a temple. <clears throat> Founded in New York City in 1900, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union was deeply influenced then by the second wave of immigration during the last quarter of the 19th century. Founded under the principles of inclusivity, the union historically was made up of Jewish and Eastern European immigrants, as well as Italian and Irish immigrants in places like New York and Chicago. Per its 1937 Handbook of Trade Union Methods with special reference to the garment trades, the organization prioritized issues including sex, age, skill, nationality, and religion. Although 
The ILGWU attempted to gain a foothold in Cleveland during the last two decades of the 19th century uh, with little success. Poor working conditions and low wages caused some workers to form small seasonal unions, such as the Cleveland Pressers Protective Union as early as 1899. By the year 1900, union interest increased following the ILGWU's official founding in New York City and its profound commitment to an ethic of compassion and cooperation inspired it to make contributions to the American body and soul. It was noted then as a pioneer of social movements, political, economic, educational, medical, industrial, and international. Between the years of 1911 and 1933, the ILGWU stabilized and improved the garment industries of Cleveland, Ohio, through its sheer diligence in equality and representation, its effectiveness in strikes, settlements, and union negotiations, and its own diverse network of mutual aid for its members. As early as 1903, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union was active in Cleveland, Ohio, a city regarded in nationally as one of the worst country, worst in the country for the sweating system or what is known as the contract system. So in order to showcase why this union was so impactful in places like Cleveland, I also wanted to specifically highlight some of the working conditions for garment workers with focus on women. In the eyes of union leaders, such as A. Bisno of Chicago, Cleveland was deemed one of the foremost cloak and ladies garment manufacturing centers in the world, and several thousand people, mostly men and young girls, make their living at it. Due to its centrality in the United States, its diverse population of immigrants, and its own industrial might at the time, Cleveland, Ohio would then become a significant city in later strikes and union movements. Now, when people think about the progressive era and labor unions and strikes, they often think about the sweatshop, which I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, the sweatshop itself was actually born out of what we say is the needle trade or the garment trade and was dependent on the contract system. Now the contract system is operated by a contractor or an employer who manages all of the finances for the factory, then contracts employees for work. Uh, it was noted that it was considered a sweating system, hence the term sweatshop was born out of it as most bosses were paid union wages, but by the time it filtered down to their workers, there was very little left for them. Compounded with safety issues, sexual harassment, and even death, the sweatshop provided very little to some, yet risked so much to others. And in this photo you'll see here, it's known as the tournament of today. Um, and you can see that it features what would be a medieval or early Renaissance knight, um, horse on a train titled Monopoly, uh, you can see there's also some ties to capitalism and the poor individual on the horse, which looks exhausted, is a laborer who is also fighting for strikes and better conditions and yet will probably lose in light of monopoly and capitalism. I've also included this quote from the Cleveland Plain Dealer that states, but according to labor men, the sweating or contract system is directly responsible for the sweatshop evil because it is not, it is not the manufacturers who force their workers to toil in unsanitary surroundings, but the contractors who send the work out to be done. All the safety and sanitation issues that many recall when reflecting on tenement housing during the second wave of immigration, including the ideas of ghettos and, and slums were reflected in the factory floor as well. Overcrowding was actually a particularly dangerous aspect seen in the Triangle Fire of 1911, as many barely had room to move about their workplace. Despite what appeared to be a strong start to unionization in Cleveland, the president at the time of the ILGWU in the early 1900s, Herman Grossman, claims that under the present policy of manufacturers, it is hard for the women to earn a livelihood. Thus, attempts to better these wages and overall working conditions specifically for women in the garment industry appeared underway at an early point in this history. Uh, unfortunately, Grossman also stated that the local chapters in the city had been significantly weakened following a strike earlier in the summer. And at that time in Cleveland, there were 1,000 union cloak makers and cutters, many of which were not making more than $6 a week as early as 1905. By 1910, as you can imagine then, industrial reform seemed destined for those toiling within the garment industries of America. Strikes continued to debate and settle with manufacturers over wages and union recognition, yet workplace disasters and fires continued to regularly appear in the media. This picture is of the 10th floor of the Ash Building following once the fire was put out. 
And we have an eyewitness from United Press who was passing through Washington Square and saw the fire. And again, I apologize, this quote is, is depressing. He stated, William G. Shepard stated, I was walking through Washington Square when a puff of smoke issuing from the factory building caught my eye. I reached the building before the alarm was turned in. I saw every feature of the tragedy visible from outside the building. I learned a new sound, a more horrible sound than description can picture. It was the thud of a speeding living body on a stone sidewalk. I looked upon the heap of dead bodies and I remembered these girls were the shirt waist makers. I remembered their great strike last year in which these same girls had demanded more sanitary conditions and more safety precautions within the shops. Their dead bodies were the answer. Now, according to the New York Times article um, that you see in one of these pictures uh, to the far right, was published a day after the Triangle Shirtwaist factory, factory fire. And as I mentioned, it stated that the company employed 600 women and less than 100 men. Um, located in the Ash Building in New York City, the building had also recently experienced four fires leading up to the Triangle Fire. And the building itself had been reported by the fire department to the building department as unsafe on account of the insufficiency of its exits. So as many can see, had employers taken the necessary precautions, perhaps the tragedy could have been avoided. Despite the reg regular occurrence of fires within large cities like New York, this fire was disturbingly public, um, just highlighting to many Americans how dangerous the sweatshop could be for its workers, especially from eyewitness accounts like Shepard, who had never realized to the extent how dangerous and how unsafe those conditions could be. In the March 26, 1911 edition of the New York Times, it was claimed that strewn about as firemen worked, the bodies indicated clearly the preponderance of women workers. Here and there was a man, but almost always they were women. And yet, despite being the majority of the workforce in the garment industry, these young women were not protected within their workplaces on an array of levels. Scholars such as Daniel E. Bender argue that in spite of women often being the majority of the needle trade in the workforce, uh, many female immigrant garment workers were surrounded by male coworkers, and these women often faced inappropriate jokes from their male counterparts and coworkers, as well as unwanted touches from their bosses. He stated that the memoirs of female and male garment workers suggest that everything from salacious bantering and indecent ribaldry to sexual demands created a highly sexualized workplace. Because the majority of female workers within the garment industries were often young Orthodox Jewish women, Harassment prevailed as a power tool used by their male coworkers to counter with their own status, newly found status as being a minority in this field. Young Orthodox Jewish women were especially targeted as male coworkers found it humorous to poke fun at certain traditions. And more so they found it amusing to purposefully make these young women who often tended to dress conservatively and traditionally, uncomfortable with sexual innuendos, unwanted touching and grabbing. Bender even notes in his article that women such as Pesha, an Eastern European Jewish immigrant, once left her own work in tears over a particularly distasteful marriage joke in which it was insinuated that she was now wed to her boss and her fellow male coworker stepped on a glass and shouted mazel tov while uttering traditional Jewish blessings. Alongside sexual harassment towards female garment workers, ethnicity and religion played an essential role in workplace hostility. In the eyes of other scholars such as Teresa Wolfson, the garment industries themselves were born in the sweatshops and had a tradition of excessive exploitation, homework, and violence. And other scholars state that within labor's, women's labor history itself, the issue of sexual harassment is not only one of the most noted, but the least studied. In his Out of the Sweatshop, uh, Leon Stein asserts that the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in March of 1881 had a direct and profound impact on the garment industry in the United States. Following this event, Russia saw a distinct wave of bloody and violent pogroms against Jewish neighborhoods with both, within both the cities and rural Egypt regions of Russia. These pogroms thus induced, as you can imagine, a mass exodus for those whose lives were ultimately destroyed by discrimination and prejudice. The concept of unionization is directly tied to Eastern European populations. Mutual aid institutions became heavily entrenched within the community. And as a result, the Jewish community within Cleveland was able to develop strong ties with other Eastern European neighborhoods, especially in Cleveland, uh, as well as 
Italian and Irish neighborhoods. Remnants of Jewish culture and social cohesion are still evident in places today like Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, and what would later become Beechwood. But pictured here, you see from the Sanborn map collection, uh, Woodland Avenue and East 9th Street. And this was known as the Woodland neighborhood where a lot of this Jewish community was contained. <clears throat> An oral history conducted as part of the Immigrant Experience Project by the Greater Cleveland Ethnographic Museum lays testament to the fact that Cleveland, Ohio, like many other industrial cities, was no exception to the gilded facade that is America during the first few years of the 1900s. In 1978, Libby Malkin, a Jewish woman originally from Odessa, Ukraine, highlighted what she and many others had to endure in their homelands. Libby first came to Cleveland in 1907, and two years prior, her family had withstood a particularly harsh pogrom in Odessa, in Odessa, where they hid in a cellar for three days living on bread and water with only one candle for their light. Following these poor conditions and damp conditions, Malkin's father died of consumption of the throat, and following their own financial ruin as the family bookstore was destroyed in this violent affair, Malkin's final, family finally deserted decided to move to the United States where her brothers had found work in Cleveland and in Chicago. She claimed that even after escaping and surviving uh, the pogrom, uh, it wasn't any easier in the United States because she stated, quote, we were so deaf and dumb and blind because we couldn't read, we couldn't speak, we didn't know what people were talking about. And like many other Jewish immigrants, her family resided near Woodland Avenue in the Woodland neighborhood, uh, being the center of the community at the time. Yet, unlike many Jewish women, she herself did not work in the garment industry, but worked in another regionally popular industry, a cigar factory. According to her, she worked 10 hours a day for six days a week for a total of $3 a week. Instead, it was her sister who was part of the needle trade and was noted for her fine needlework as a buttonhole maker. She, like many other garment workers, especially women, participated in what was called piecework, which is defined as any type of employment in which a worker is paid a fixed piece rate for each unit produced. According to Malkin, this was good money, and yet the family couldn't afford to furnish their new apartment to their original ideals. In spite of what for them was at least favorable conditions compared to other immigrant families, her family lived in a small apartment with a bathroom, which had no water, hot water tank, no electricity, and she claimed that it wasn't very pleasant when they got here. Because the family had little possessions, they survived on minimalist items and basic home furnishings. She stated near the end of her interview that we didn't have anything from Russia. We were destitute during the pogrom. We haven't a thing of remembrance of that, our life, that's all. And like many immigrants who came to America looking for opportunity, when her family arrived in Cleveland, they were, as she stated, very disappointed. <clears throat> Recent scholarly explorations suggest that collective trauma and memory are vital for a number of immigrant and minority communities, but specifically trauma and memory are vital in Jewish ideals of suffering. The traditions of suffering itself is deeply embedded into union principles and movements in America. The daily drudgery of work fostered the growth of known socialist ethics within an array of trades and tied to mutual aid and community societies many came from their hometowns back in Europe. Uh, these ethics then became the heart of labor movements. You see a word on this slide called Landsmannschaften, which means that these are immigrant societies who specifically came from the same neighborhood back in Europe. Thus, they nurtured community cohesion and birthed their own neighborhoods willing to help other ethnic neighborhoods in time of distress, as well as provide social contacts, uh, professional development and networking, and even assist with medical care. Although living conditions appeared to be only a slight improvement to some living within Cleveland, many refugees sought to preserve their old world, old world traits and customs. As other ethnic neighborhoods established themselves in Cleveland, it was specifically the Jewish neighborhood that founded an array of mutual aid organizations, including the Hebrew Relief Society in 1875, the Hebrew Free Loan Association in 1905, which by 1909 had given out 699 loans, amounting to over $20,000. <clears throat> These organizations also included the Home for Aged and Infirmed Israelites, the Jewish Orphan Asylum, which you see pictured here to the right, um, which was noted for being the pride of the Cleveland Jewish community, 
as well as the Cleveland Council of Jewish Women, which conducted evening classes, established a public playground, and created vocational schooling. It also helped establish the Martha House, a settlement house for Jewish working women, pictured to the left. And worth noting, the organization had ties to the Ladies Sewing Society. And as the council conducted its meetings, some of those social meetings may have also discussed working conditions for women within the needle trade. This sense of community and determination then resulted in several forms um, include of individuality, including the development of newspapers, printing in both English and Yiddish, such as the Jewish Review and Observer, the Jewish Independent, and a Yiddish only paper, the, the Jewish Daily Press established in 1908. Now specifically, the Jewish Review and Observer was published every Friday and was used extensively in this research. Uh, covered dances, labor strikes, world news, and even concerts happening locally. And in July of 1910, the complexities of the Cleveland Jewish community came to light, including a detailed calendar of upcoming religious and secular holidays, community events, and the edition also reported on, con on the conditions for Jewish people in Russia at the time and discrimination within the military. In that same publication, it also detailed what was called the Great Strike, which featured 50,000 workers, 5,000 of whom were women. And I will talk about the strike in the following year, but the 1910 movement was the first to happen in the last 16 years, signifying union growth across the nation. Unfortunately, it was noted for being almost an utter impossibility. Uh, strikers were protesting for at the very most a 48 hour work week, paid legal holidays and wages to be raised and paid in cash. Contesting overlooked safety precautions, unequitable wages, unsanitary working conditions, sexual discrimination, and harassment, members of the ILGWU in Cleveland represented the best qualities of Lan Man Shoften. It was stated by that same rabbi, Moses J. Grice, that during this time there was a significant rise in development of institutions and organizations which distinguished Cleveland as one of the most important centers of Jewish life in the United States. <clears throat> Unionization principles and policies then, as you can imagine, were fairly familiar to Eastern European and Jewish immigrants who had been previously working in factories in their homelands. Many who came to the United States in this time also came with what Gus Tyler says is a con considerable political and trade union experience, thus making the development of labor unions such as the ILGWU an accustomed undertaking. Upon their arrival to the United States, many immigrants brought with them a long and illustrious path past that many felt had application for the present and perspectives for the future. <clears throat> Due to their messianic beliefs, many American Jews, especially those who eventually took large roles within labor unions, believed that the real Messiah or the savior was the people themselves. And in this ideal, the impoverished, overlooked and underestimated Jewish garment workers then could be their own saviors. As I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about strikes today. And unfortunately, as much as I would love to tell you about every single strike, we would be here for four hours. Um, so today I'm probably gonna just cover the 1911 strike, um, but I do wanna open with a little bit leading up to it, such as the fourth annual ILGWU convention, which was held in Cleveland in June of 1903, in which a banquet was thrown for President Herman Grossman, General Secretary and Treasurer B. Broff and other union officers. And at their annual meeting, Union officials discussed and reported on the tenement housing situation in New York, as well as the growth of the union into other industrial cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, and Boston. That June, the organization reported that not only did the union membership contain both sexes, it had grown its membership to 22,000 people throughout the nation. At this annual convention, a resolution was also adopted in which it recognized a socialist platform and urged the workers to unite politically as well as industrially. Although labor strikes had become a fairly regular occurrence in industrial America by this point, garment strikes in Cleveland, Ohio were vital in the years 1911, which I'll talk about today, 1916, 1918, and 1933. And not only were these headlining years for the ILGWU, they were also years of change at the local, national, and international level, both realistic and symbolic. In 1910, the potential for a groundbreaking strike was plausible, yet when the strike finally took place that summer, it resulted in a stalemate following which workers withdrew their negotiations. For many labor union organizers, the need for a provocation was evident if change was to be made, 
but many were unaware that tragedy was looming on the horizon. Within days after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, enraged garment workers began striking throughout the United States, calling for manufacturers to be held accountable for a blatant disregard of safety regula regulations that had already begun to span the nation. Due to its centrality and industrial might, Cleveland, Ohio had been chosen as early as 1910 to be the next site for the massive ILGWU strike. Following the tragic loss of life during the Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911, and already disgruntled relations between employee and employer across the nation, 1911 then became a pivotal year for garment workers. To union leaders, Cleveland was, a, was better prepared for a strike due to previous unionization attempts. In the month following the massive factory fire, strike leaders met to organize a strike for that summer. And for some, the grievances of the Cleveland garment workers represented national sentiments. Others in the needle trade shared the same strife of long hours during the peak or height season and irregular and market lows, making wage insufficient and even unlivable at times. The arrival of Josephine Casey, a Chicago labor organizer brought to Cleveland that same April in hopes of bringing more women and girls into the union was actively covered by the Cleveland Plain Dealer, as you can see in the article stated, War, woman to form new labor union to the left-hand side. According to the article, President Rosenberg claimed that Casey had already organized the first corset makers union in the United States at Kalamazoo, Michigan, with a membership of 800 out of the 1,000 corset makers there. In that same article, the Cleveland Plain Dealer stated that throughout this strike, union officials planned to demand the abolition of overtime work accepting in rush season, and then not for more than two hours a day. Union officials and striking workers were also fighting for no work on Saturday afternoons, especially it being the Sabbath for some, and Sundays, and insisted on a 50-hour working week, daily hours from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., except during rush season, which to some of us is probably not asking a lot for those of us that work for 40 hours a week. As planning for the 1911 strike continued, the Plain Dealer actively covered meetings, conferences, and shifting demands. Um, in Garment Workers Busy, heads of women's union discuss wage situation. Sessions were meeting regularly throughout the first week in April of 1911. And per the article, the purpose of these sessions was to establish better hours for the garment workers for the country and to present a more uniform wage scale nationwide. By the first week of June 11, there was a clear warning that a big strike would loom in the garment trade, which had the potential to threaten Cleveland shops and 30,000 workers by the end of that week. Not only would a strike begin at the week end, but workers' demands were clearly outlined in the article that you see here, uh, including higher wages, better working conditions, and specifically of importance, recognition of unions. Backed by a general agreement to strike should the demands not be met, the ILGWU ma mailed these demands to the following shops you see highlighted, including some that became significantly important, such as Woolcraft Company, um, Black & Co., Latin Bloomfield and Green Hut Company, as well as American, suit, American Skirt and Suit Company. At the time of the publication, only one company had thus far agreed to sign these agreements, but the name of the company had not been disclosed. The announcement then of this strike, as well as this information and who it was mailed to, was also distributed in English, Yiddish, and Bohemian, thus targeting the ILGWU's and garment industry's diverse workforce. Although many garment industries consolidated throughout the 20th century, just this number of factories in Cleveland, Ohio, attests to its industrial might and its importance to the garment industry at a national level, um, because many who were of Jewish descent were already working in needle trades in their hometowns. And then when came over, were aptly able to join the workforce here in America. Within a few days of the strike outbreak, President Rosenberg was called to Cleveland to assist in the official strike. In the Cleveland Plain Dealer, it noted that a particular feature to strikes in the garment trade is the number of women involved. Of the 1500 women on strike were out of employment because of the strike, are mothers young and old, young women and girls not yet out of short dresses. The strikers of the quote, gentler sex are affiliated for the most part with local 27 skirt makers and local 20 finishers. It's also noted that the finishers are the strongest union of women in Cleveland. It was organized in Cleveland by Ida Bax and Sarah Moskowitz, who is the financial secretary, 
And as a male union worker put it, one of the brainiest among her striking sisters. And although it was a resolute set of demands, it was amicable at first, and these strikers aimed their efforts toward better working conditions. And rather than resort to physical tactics, they hoped to win public opinion following their walkout, and in doing so promised no violence until June 10th, 1911. And you'll see here, this is a close-up of a Sanborn map, um, also of the Woodland neighborhood, and near the edge of it is circled a garment factory, also an electric power company and a printing company as well. So just right around the corner for many who were living within the Woodland neighborhood. On June 10th, 1911, the Cleveland Plain Dealer reported that two riots occurred in conjunction with the ILGWU strike in Cleveland, in which one striker was seriously wounded by a bullet fired from local policemen, and two others were badly injured. Rafael Lorenzo, a 31-year-old, was shot by patrolman John Becker, who was then clubbed over the head by a fellow striker. Another patrolman suffered a knife wound on his right cheek. And patrolman Lewis W. Hold injured his right hand. Two fellow strikers were also wounded in the riots, which began that afternoon on the west side of Cleveland. Continuing for two hours, the riots saw the use of police clubs, resulting in many major, many minor, I'm sorry, head injuries to unnamed striking garment workers. Although both strike leaders and manufacturers deplored the violent outbreaks, neither began negotiations and neither claimed to be ready to do so. Due to the loss of life and multiple injuries, strike leaders then canceled all Sunday meetings that following week and urged strikers to avoid further demonstrations over the weekend. Alongside that, following the death of George Tamice, killed by Benny Aquino, and the arrest of Josephine K Casey in the past week, that Chicago organizer, a union officials warned strikers to keep away from factories in what is today the warehouse district. Rather, they recommended that union members enjoy the nice weather and the Sabbath with their families at nearby parks. And by the end of the weekend, Josephine Casey, along with six other strikers arrested, were discharged without trial. Now, specifically Casey as a woman in the garment labor union, as well as being someone who organized unions altogether from the ground up was an inspiration to many female garment workers in Cleveland, Ohio. Unfortunately, in spite of what appeared to be a pause in violence throughout the strike, women, children, and peaceful strikers were assaulted the following sun Saturday night by hired sluggers. What would turn out to be hired police officers themselves were responsible for the violent clubbing of peaceful workers, thus inciting another riot to begin the following week on Monday, picketing at every garment establishment in Cleveland, Ohio. Throughout the summer, the 1911 ILGWU strike continued, and so did its corresponding violence. Near the end of June, Israel Goldstein was shot in the back by guards in an automobile after strikers were caught throwing rocks at the drivers. And alongside Goldstein, Max Becker was shot in the ankle, two girls struck with missiles, and two innocent individuals who were mistaken for strikers were severely beaten by police. Alongside an array of injuries, both men and women were consistently being arrested for disorderly conduct and assault. At the end of the month, prominent union officials began attempting negotiations with the Cleveland garment factories as dissatisfied workers stood firm declaring that unless their terms were met by July 1st, additional demands would be forced. Because the arm garment industries of Cleveland and their production halted as workers walked out, many employers then began importing what we would call strike breakers to fill their place, thus testing the strike itself by reopening for production. When the first train of imported strikers was brought to Cleveland, it was fired upon by strikers in the midst of the chaos. And in, in that chaos, two strikers and sympathizers were shot as well as two strike breakers and riot ensued following. Yet despite the violence, the workers had appeared to be citywide support, sorry, as various publications called for peace, acknowledged the ongoing violence and distributed the union ideals throughout their publications. By the end of June, other industry union leaders throughout Cleveland made plans to march alongside garment workers as more strike breakers were being imported from New York City and demonstrations continued into mid-August, which would see what was believed to be the biggest demonstration yet. And in fact, in August, 1911, no less than 10,000 men, women, and children were expected to march through the principal parts of town. Now, some of those unions that walked alongside them included steel workers, um, cigar makers, as well as um, some auto parts makers as well. 
And again, this is featuring the Woodland Avenue neighborhood and showing a little bit of where they might've been walking. Uh, the strikers performed at Utopia Hall on Woodland Avenue Southeast near East 34th Street. And the march would then proceed up to in the left hand bottom corner that is East 9th Street. And then would continue heading west to Euclid Avenue to Public Square through the major garment district on Lakeside Avenue Northwest to Superior Avenue Northeast. It then had plans to circle back to Utopia Hall from East 19th Street, which at the time was deemed the unofficial ILGWU Cleveland headquarters, making it a prominent feature in this strike. Although this strike was inspirational to many, the initial efforts were futile. By September, the workers' demands were not met and the strike continued. The arrival of the American Federation of Labor on September 21st, 1911 signified change as the organization showed what was deemed unlimited support for Cleveland garment workers. Initial demands at the beginning had changed significantly throughout the summer. And although the demands of working hours were still principal, they now shifted to be at max 50 hours a week with the demand to work not on Saturday or Sunday, and not a recognition of religious holidays, but at least legal holidays, as well as no extra charges to employees for machinery, broken needles, or silk and cotton, which tended to be a fairly regular occurrence within the sweatshop and in the contract system, as if you broke a needle, you were then often charged out of your paycheck for it. In September, even though the strike was continuing, the Cleveland Plain Dealer reported that the Jewish New Year was religiously kept in Rosh Hashanah Ceremonies were attended by all stations, including employers, strikers, and non-union workers, and battles were paused. Although violence had clearly dominated much of the summer, there was a clear understanding of who made up this striking population. Immigrant-based labor, especially those of Jewish descent, clearly dominated not only Cleveland garment industry, but the Cleveland branch of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Thus, the commemoration and cease violence highlights that in spite of the strike and in spite of the violence, there was at least some mutual respect inherent within the industry of respecting one's religious beliefs. Despite the violence, poor working conditions, low wages and long hours, both sides of the strike recognized the significance of commemorating Rosh Hashanah. Strikers removed all picket lines, were not discussing the strike during the celebration, and instead many worshiped at temple as employers, manufacturers closed their door for the holiday. Although many manufacturers closed, the plain dealer argued that their reopening would also reopen one of the most prolonged and bitter labor struggles in the history of Ohio. In October, 1911, garment workers voted on the potential to return to strike and began holding fundraisers and dances to generate more funds as their budget had been significantly depleted. Unfortunately, as the fall rapidly approached, the local ILGWU's summer of striking had completely depleted the budget at this point. The vote was due to happen on the 22nd of October, yet very little strikers showed to the meeting and the vote never happened because many workers with their financial situation were forced to return or reapply for their own jobs. In this sense, the 1911 strike had come to an unfortunate end and demands were not met, yet union officials began saving plans for a strike in 1912. Many garment industries were given their old jobs back and those who could not return to work, previous employers took down their names and addresses for future opportunities. For those temporarily unemployed by the garment industry, the New York chapter of the ILGWU provided financial aid. By the end of October, no definite promise had been made, but Secretary John A. Deich said that he expected to be able to pay benefits throughout the winter for unemployed garment workers. Uh, these benefits, which would provide significant financial assistance to displaced workers, ended up totaling about 800 striking workers who were unable to return to their previous positions. Therefore, the 1911 ILGW strike in Cleveland was noted as turbulent, violent, and ultimately unsuccessful as it lasted roughly 138 days without making any significant negotiation or changes. It not only saw the death of many Clevelanders, but saw the arrest of countless others striking for better working conditions, safety precautions, and fair wages. More than that, the strike itself was a catalyst in community cohesion and unification, as well as mutual aid. One that, although deemed unsuccessful by some, resulted in a deeply, deeply symbolic change, one that would not only establish the ILGWU in Cleveland, 
but it would also foster later strikes to be more organized, such as the ones in 1918, 1916, and 1933, which you can see the 1933 strike vote is in, pictured here. Unlike the 1911 strike, especially the 1933 strike ended fairly successful with several companies signing negotiation treat agreements with the Cleveland ILG ILGWU chapter. Although many strikes in, Cle in the Cleveland garment industry occurred throughout the 20th century, the ILGWU left a distinct impact on the city from 1911 until 1933. One that established the union as a force to be reckoned with, one that asserted the diversity of the union and one that fostered at times citywide support to its dedicated laborers. Later considered by scholars to be one of, if not the most progressive union of its time, the ILGWU, born out of workplace tragedy, unfair wages and discrimination, bolstered community cohesion, incorporating vast immigrant peoples within itself, specifically immigrant women, and established mutual aid for its workers, including death benefits for surviving members in case of accident. Noted for jingles like look for the union label, which I'll play here in a second, the union is then cemented in social, gender, and labor, labor history. Its long history spans almost a full century until it closed its doors and merged with another union in 1999, and its ability to stir the masses for change has made the ILGWU and other unions a vital piece of American history, culture, and society. Had the union never taken root in Cleveland, Ohio when it did, the poor working conditions, sexual harassment, and unfair wages may have persisted longer than other industrial cities. And had, it ne had union officials never assisted in the local efforts as early as 1911, the relationship between employee and employer may have suffered immensely, making later strikes as violent as the 1911 one. The ILGWU, is an example of an ethnically diverse and united front which sought workplace reform, leaving a legacy that fosters acceptance and justice for current immigrant communities and providing protections for today's industrial unions throughout the nation. Dedicated and diverse, the garment strikes throughout the 20th century provide hope for a better future within Cleveland, Ohio. There used to be more of us in the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, but a lot of our jobs have disappeared. A lot of the clothes Americans are buying for women and kids are imports. They're being made in foreign places. When the work's done here, we can support our families and pay our taxes and buy the things other Americans make. That's what it means when the label says union. Look for the union label. When you are buying a coat dress or blouse, remember some. So thank you all for listening to me talk about the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. And if you have any questions following this, um, you're welcome to email me at the email you see here, torinfo at oberlinheritage.org. And if you're curious about the following strikes that I cover within my research, please stay on the lookout for a later publication. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So if you have questions, do feel free to unmute yourself or you can type it into the chat box to either Stephanie or me and we'll, we'll read it off to people. And while people might be thinking, Stephanie, I'm gonna give you one. I know with projects like this, you always wish you had more time or maybe that one resource that maybe doesn't exist or you you know it must exist, but you haven't found it yet. So what, what do you really wish was out there that you could add to this? Well, I'd really like some more first person perspectives. I'd really love to see more oral histories of women, specifically immigrant women who actually participated in the strikes uh, because many of the officials were often men, their story continues to be subverted. Um, there's also one resource that's still at BGSU libraries that I wish I actually had, but it is a special collection item and it is an educational pamphlet distributed in the 1920s by the ILGWU. So that source would be really great to just have on hand. 
um, but the 1937 handbook and some of the, um, for example, Out of the Sweatshop was written by somebody who was active in unions as well as the Gus Tyler Look for the Union label. So those sources were really important, but I think more oral histories, specifically of Cleveland, you find a lot in New York and in Chicago, as well as some of those primary sources would be really amazing. <laughs> Thanks, and anyone else do feel uh, welcome to chime in. I have one. Um, what replaced the union? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of it. Sorry, everyone, that's my mom. Um <laughs> have to say that <laughs> it's the um, I'm gonna I always mispronounce it it's the amalgamated workers garment workers um, overall union is what they ended up partnering with and that's why the ILGWU closed its doors in 1999 because it became part of this larger national and then eventually international labor union specifically dedicated to clothing but as the video showed unfortunately the union is not active anymore as international importation of clothing um, significantly hurt the Cleveland garment industries. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. And um, for everyone, you know, if a question comes up later, Stephanie's not going anywhere. She's working at the Heritage Center. So you are welcome to reach out to our offices directly. And uh, again, there will be that feedback form going out either tomorrow or the next day. So you can reply to that uh, directly or include it in your uh, feedback response as well. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing your research and this history with us. And thank you all for coming tonight. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs> And Stephanie, as the host, I think you have to end the meeting. <laughs>